hi everybody. Um, they asked me to come in and talk a little bit about uh, assembling your first sales team. And so I, I should probably just say a little bit about where I am now and why this, why I actually experienced all of this stuff. Um, Shipwire, we started it in 2007. Um, we had the audacious plan to compete with Amazon Fulfillment um, in a low funding environment. Um, so we actually started a global um, e-commerce business that we plugged, our software plugged into warehouses around the world. And so if you have a product line that you want to take to market, I'm getting a lot of echo. Okay. Um, so if you actually have a product line you want to take to market globally, we'll help you move it around the world, plug it into Amazon and all the shopping carts in the world and retailers, and then as orders come in, we actually pick, pack, and ship it and move it around the world. Um, so Shipwire was a SaaS platform, um, and we, early on, we were trying to figure out, well, how do we sell this thing? And so literally for the first eight years of Shipwire, we never did cold calling. We built an inbound marketing engine, and then we had a sales team that um, literally, we, I called it sales assisted onboarding. The sales team would bring in the, um, would, would the customer would call in or they'd raise their hand on the website or something like that, and then, they, um, and then the salesperson would just walk them through the process. So we, I built an inbound sales team, we built outbound sales teams afterwards, um, and then now we're building enterprise sales and account management. So what I'm gonna walk you guys through is a couple of quick tips on kind of, as you're an early stage, like how to think about sales, and then um, leave you guys with a few thoughts, and then my hope is it's gonna be mostly question and answered. I'm gonna spend a bit of time on like what the funnel looks like and how to target in various parts of the funnel as well. Um, and then afterwards, I've got some handouts on like what an inbound and outbound marketing funnel can look like that we can send to you guys later. I try to make it real self-explanatory. So um, right now, I'm still at Shipwire. We sold it to Ingram Micro. We're starting a company, well, the division of Ingram Micro, we've rebranded into Ingram Micro Commerce. Um, and so I'm actually middle management in a Fortune 100 company now. So, um, but I've also, I, I, I stay really plugged into the startup scene and do a lot of early stage advising, particularly in sales and marketing. And so these are the people that I work with. So first thing, um, don't try and just hire. You have to do everything yourself. So first things first, you, you obviously basic product market fit is gonna be absolutely critical, but if you haven't sold it first and you haven't actually deployed it, you have to do that. You can't hire sales to do that. First, call it the first five deployments, you literally have to muscle it over the finish line, figure out what your toolkits are, figure out where the sticky points are. This is all part of your product market fit, right? And I would say that this modality applies up until 10 years. If you're lighting up a new sales channel, you, the founder, need to do it first. You, if you're gonna go from inbound to outbound, you need to start doing your own outbound sales. If you're going from outbound to inbound, you need to create your inbound engine and you need to have struggled through it. Channel sales, same thing. So have one, of, one person on your founding teams needs to be in charge of doing it first from a sales perspective. Um, and again, it doesn't, this, this isn't a time for pretty. Get it over the finish line um, and then try and repeat it. You have to have done it a couple of times. Once you repeat it, you'll have, you'll have a much better idea of, of um, let me, I'll just give you an example. The first time we started doing, we, start, we thought we had to do outbound sales. We needed to bring in bigger merchants into Shipwire, and then we're hitting us on the website. So we were like, how do we go into outbound sales? And so we literally sat down and started sending emails. So through LinkedIn, we were hacking emails and just literally sending emails, and we would, we'd figured out what the templates were. We cracked the code on that, and then not only did we realize we didn't have to actually hire outbound salespeople to do it, we outsourced the entire team to, uh, to Upwork and hired contractors for three to four dollars an hour to do all of that and then we scaled that to about 30 of them over time and then we hired people to manage them and so the process was started doing the emails first myself doing all of that figuring out how to replicate it hiring people on, on at that point it was Odesk to replicate that point and then hiring once I was done managing them 
hiring people to manage them, and then hiring people to hire the managers. And we had like three tiers of management dealing with all this and putting in KPIs on it. So do it yourself first. Um, you can get over a lot of sales mishaps if you have lead gen flow. So um, if, if you think the problem is, if you're not getting any traction and you think the problem is sales, and your sales team has, if you're looking at it, they're like, hey, I'm closing one in 10, maybe I'm closing one in 20 leads that come in. I have a, we have a rule that is at Shipwire, and this has been consistent for the last five years. We will close 20% of our total opportunity value in a given quarter. So if I pump in marketing, uh, you know, $100 million in value into it, I'll close 20 million. Actually, that's too big, but. If I pump a million dollars in, I'll close 200,000. And that's just been consistent. But I need to have that amount of flow to even it out. So your big lever in marketing is actually, and sorry, in sales is actually lead gen. Is that 20% basically uh, all identified and closed in the quarter, or is there longer tail? Longer tail. 20% of everything I got out, I know I'm going to close. I, it's, the, it's just the going, it's like, and, and it's not, on lead numbers, it's on opportunity value. It's on dollar. It's on dollar calced. Sorry, is that kind of like if someone's gonna have budget for two quarters? Can you count that? I'll I'll put that in uh, in the next quarter. It's gonna be where the just ba we do it based on where they're gonna start. So once we have their timing, that's when that's when the quarter will put it in. I'll I'll know when I got the lead and I'll know where the marketing budget counts. But we will put the. Uh, We'll put where it's going to close in the quarter that they intend to start. That way, we know when to work the deal. So, the big one is know who owns lead gen. Go ahead. Sorry, I will do that. Thank you. Uh, so the 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 two questions were really uh, around the the value of uh, how to value it and when it counts. So, okay, the last thing about sales: don't think of sales as a person. Think of it as an engine. Um, and if I can, if, if there's only one thing you take away from this presentation, it's lead gen and engine. Um, you're, so what we're going to do is we're going to now break down some of the parts of the sales engine, um, and we're going to talk about how to hire into various ones of those parts. But this is, um, people call it a revenue engine, whatever it is, but you need to realize that you're not just hiring salespeople that are good. If you invest in the people, you're actually investing in the wrong part of your business. You need to be investing in the engine and the people are the ones managing your engine. Your value, what your exiting value is, is going to be the value of your revenue engine. So whatever you can do to think about it as pieces of the engine and people managing it, I would really re-ratchet your brain to be thinking that way. Okay, so first thing, what's the shape of your funnel? Um, do you, do, you need to generate, do you need to generate interest, or is interest coming to you is going to help you understand this? Um, and then I like to think about, like, I didn't know who was going to be the audience, but generally I see, is your platform going to be self-service? People come in, and then your, your, your application, you have to focus on the application because you really want this SMB space where you don't want bodies touching every lead. Your application needs to take them through the application flow. It's self-service. Um, or is it somewhere in between, you know, it's custom. Sorry, if it's custom, you've got people out there and like the application is not the thing that the individual is being sold on. It's the value, the benefit. What's it gonna do for them? The application is the delivery vehicle. And then there's this space in between, which is where Shipwire kind of unfortunately lived for a long period of time, and we still do, which is I call it sales assisted onboarding. The app is too complex for it to be completely self-service. Um, it's, it's got so many power features that you really need a salesperson to explain it. And pricing is so wonky, you need a salesperson to actually custom cut the deal as it comes through. So what we ended up building is a sales-assisted onboarding practice where the idea is the salesperson between, between Salesforce and the application knows where the customer is at, in the app and knows what they should be thinking about at that particular stage. Is it in a pre-sales mode? It's not necessarily in the app. If they're in the app, they're thinking about, for us, it's bringing inventory in, 
what it looks like when it's stored in the warehouse and how to get it out of the warehouse. But I see this very consistently with applications that have this higher than SMB mid-market approach, but the, the application is really geared for the lowest common denominator to help them reduce the customer, the customer support load to the, to the SaaS application. So um, where do you, what's the shape of your funnel? Where are you having stickiness? Are you having stickiness where the customer starts in the application and then can't get through it? In which case, you may not lead, a, you, you're gonna need a different type of salesperson. Or do you have, do you have stickiness when they, they're onboarded, but they're only seeing 1% of the value of it and they need to be able to be explained through the other 99% of the value. The problem is not in the, in the lead gen or the conversion, the problem is actually in the account management piece of, of your funnel. So think about your application and we'll kind of come back to, uh, to this slide in a little bit because I want you guys to, to be able to kind of throw problem sets at us and let's, we'll, we'll apply it to this. Um, okay, so generally this is me in PowerPoint a couple of nights ago, so please recognize it's, it's not great. Um, uh, everybody kind of looks at sales as this piece of the funnel, the top triangle, but really the value of it is extracting at the bottom. So think about it as an hourglass. Um, here's who's responsible for what. Uh, marketing, marketing and leads. Um, sales takes over from leads to accounts. Customer support and account management, depending on the type of application you have, is gonna do this. But break down your problem set and look at where you've got revenue stuck in your, in your hourglass. If the revenue is stuck and it's not coming in and you have no lead qual, you have two options. You can create an inbound engine or you can create an outbound sales engine. If you've got lots of, of inbound um, or you've got a good number of leads and you don't know if they're a good fit for your business, then you can solve it with usually pretty you know, reasonably priced sales development resources. If you have a problem getting accounts over the finish line, then you really need closers. And if you're having trouble like harvesting revenue off the backside of it, then you have an account management and a customer support problem. I was working with another company recently and they have uh, their CEO is amazing. He's, he's, uh, he's a great speaker. He generates a ton of interest. The problem is, is that customers are coming into the application and they, they, they get through it and they're getting very little value. They're, they're not getting full value for his application. And, and they're, they're not, he's not increasing the average revenue per customer. So rather than hire a bunch of salespeople, we literally focused him on how does he turn customer support people into advocates that are focused on revenue? So that he can, his problem was in harvesting, harvesting revenue, so his sales problem was really, for his first year, was about how does his customer support team make him money? We'll come, this will be the slide we come back to when we throw problems at, so. Um, what stage are you at? And we'll go through these in a minute. But founder doing sales, the evangelical kind of entrepreneurial salesperson, um, which is a role that I've played and I really enjoy. Um, is it time to hire the first couple of sales reps? I need a manager because I've got eight to 10 reps. I don't think you guys are there. Maybe some, some companies, are, are they've been here before. Or you've got, you need a VP of sales. Um, I often see startups go, I need to hire a VP of sales, when really what they're trying to do is find the person next to them that almost acts like a co-founder, and they're really the evangelical arm of the company that is part marketing person, part salesperson, part PR, part gonna hack together the inbound engine, hack together the outbound engine. That's not a VP of sales, you guys. A VP of sales is somebody that comes in and um, uh, later stage, traditional VP of sales comes in later stage and dashboards the, everything. And you get, you now have, you now have everything in your revenue engine. You can, the, the VP of sales can walk into the board and go, oh, you need to hit this target. Here's how many salespeople I need to hire. Here's how much marketing we need to put into it. It's, a, it's much more of an instrumented, um, an instrumented engine. Most early stage companies, you may have somebody that you call the VP of sales, but really what they are is this is this either a founder doing sales or evangelical salesperson. Um, so generally, kind of broke it down a little bit. Um, we already talked about the, the, the evangelist founder. 
Uh, the first reps, um, for Shipwire, where we, it was interesting, where did we hire the first reps? We were in a, we were in a weird um, hiring part of the market. First of all, we were in a kind of a dead spot in the valley. We didn't have a lot of people that wanted to work in that, in that area, Sunnyvale at the time. Um, this was 2007, so it was go-go. We hadn't hit the crash yet. Uh, LinkedIn was hiring every body, literally every single body that looked for a job would go to LinkedIn or somewhere. So there was just nobody around. So we actually, we looked at our problem set and we're like, what do we actually need? We need people that are nice to customers, that can do a split of support and sales, that we, that we want to train and we, we don't want them to leave. Like losing your early stage sales reps is super duper painful. So um, we did something completely abnormal at the time. And we, we went and we hired people that had gone through corporate training but wanted to get into sales. So we hired ex-enterprise office managers and ex-people um, who worked at uh, Wells Fargo. We knew they'd gone through great corporate training programs. We knew that they could speak. We knew that they had a customer focus. And we were willing to take the bullet and train them in our industry. We were able to put them in, and believe it or not, every single one of those people we hired is with us still to this day, and they're either managing teams or they're leading uh, overseas offices. Uh, one of them is now a VP. So um, big questions. Would you buy for them? Would you buy from them? Um, can, they, um, can they manage cold outbound? Can they manage inbound? What is the skill set that you're really looking for there? Um, after that, after you have a few sales reps, it's time to start looking for the manager. We, we struggled with this role. We actually failed in hiring twice. Um, really, really painful fails. Um, we, we had, I think, three to four sales reps. No, we had more than that. We had five sales reps. Um, process was all over the place. We built out, like most of our sales process was built out either in, in uh, Google, Google Sites, or in, um, in Salesforce, and we were on like our third crank of Salesforce, so the database was a mess. And like there was just, we were asking for fields that nobody cared about at that point. But we ended up um, finding a great player coach. Um, and we were expecting him to hold a bag and really carry quota for a long period of time for us. He came in and realized there was just so much work to be done. We just hired additional reps to carry quota. Um, and then he completely transformed into our VP of sales and was responsible for basically instrumenting the, the revenue engine um, and getting us into where we are at today. So he's still here. So um, I'll stop for a minute. Is, is there any questions about this? Yeah, please. Can you expand on player coach? Yeah, player coach. Um, uh, I, uh, a player coach is somebody that can, um, in the sales field, can go in there and sell, but then can also turn around to the person next to them and help them sell better. Um, a player coach at each stage. A player coach at the first rep is sitting there uh, when he's learning something new. He's training the person next to him to do it as well. A player coach at the director level is much more going to come in and be able to sell your mid-market account, uh, help you move into that next stage of sales. At the same time, they are going to be responsible for training your, your five to ten salespeople. At the VP level, they are going to go in there and they're going to be able to speak to the board. They're going to be able to, um, if you need to, they, they need to be, if you're still in fundraising mode, they need to be able to help you raise money. And they need to be able to go in and, and sell enterprise deals for you. That's their, that's their player position. That's when they're on the field. And then their coaching position is they need to be able to instrument your revenue engine and make sure that they're telling you how many reps you need to hire, in which locations, how much the budget's going to be to do that, and they need to be putting the screws to marketing for lead gen and the tools that his, sale, that his or her sales team is going to need to do that. Did that answer your question? So that was, the question was, what's a player coach? Um, what kind of hiring process do you have that, like, this person's right for inbound requests or outbound? Yeah, well, let me get, the question is, how, what's the hiring tactics for whether or not somebody is good for inbound or outbound? Let me answer, yeah, yeah, we're, I'm gonna, I've got a slide on hiring. We're going to go into that, but, um, for inbound, outbound, um, what I, the, the best question to ask is, is, what are you going to do in the first 90 days when you're here? And then the question needs to be, 
you should be, you should already have an idea of what you think is going to be successful because that was the first step. Have done it before and know what's working for you, right? If you're hiring the person um, because you don't know what's working for you, then there's a pretty big chance of error, right? They could come in and go, I'm going to partner with these five companies and I'm going to train their sales team to sell my product for me, right? And you're like, wow, that sounds amazing. That would be amazing. We can offset all the marketing, everything else. And then it comes in and those five companies are like, no, I don't, we don't do that. Then what? Right? So I would get down in the weeds on what they're expecting to do for 90 days. First 90 days onboarding, and that will help you understand whether or not you trust them or not, and whether or not you have believability. And then as you're interviewing, by the way, interviewing, sales, marketing, anybody, is a great way to understand whether or not you actually understand your business. Talk to the interview candidates like they should be teaching you stuff. If you're not learning something from your, from your interview candidates, they're probably not the right hire. But we'll, we'll go into this. You should be hiring. You should be looking a year out for your sales leadership. So you're going to be interviewing people. If you need a director in a year, you're starting now. And you're, you're talking to a lot of people. Um, I think our VP of sales was 65 interviews in, maybe 70, maybe 80 people. And that's just people we actually, like multiple people talk to. I'm not even sure how many we actually looked at online or something. So like expect it to take so. Some people get really lucky. I have a friend of mine who was the CEO of a company and he literally, he was looking, found somebody online, talked to them, they happened to be ready to move and it was a great fit and he interviewed like three people, right? So people get lucky too. Uh, Hundred days, ninety days, hundred twenty, perfect. Uh, question on the core management. Uh, we don't have any core for our sales team yet. I don't. We're so new. I mean, eighteen months of selling, so I don't know where to start that. Uh, I would expect you not to have to worry about that until. Don't worry about quota until you've got five or six reps, um, and just basically make sure that people can get paid and that they that you're. Uh, so the, the line for sales that stuck in my head from one of my um, old mentors a lot back is he said, salespeople are coin operated. Wherever you put the coin, they're going to operate. So if you say there's more coin to get you something that actually has no value long term, then you just paid a lot of money for something that is going to ultimately hurt your business. So, so if you're in the early stages of how do you compensate your sales team, make it, give them a living wage Make sure that they are comfortable, especially if they're doing process planning and they're helping you figure a lot of stuff out. It may take them a little while. They should be accredited. Um, they, should, they, like, like they should be bringing in more money than they're costing, for sure. But then give them a success-based comp plan. Make it real simple, though. It's simple to administer, right? Make sure that it, it pays out at the time. So they, like, if, if you're paying them on an annualized basis and they can't make the rent next month, they got a problem. Like, that's a problem for you. It's like, so make sure that you can manage it, but also make sure that like your early stage people can work for you. What are indicators that you found someone who fits the criteria and I've talked about and found work? Like what are things you probably see in the first 30 days that say this this guy is, you know, fitting the Um so I, I um the question is what is the criteria to find somebody who's kind of at your evangelist founder stage. So um, I would say I can talk to my experience. Um, so my experience was when I sat down with the, the guy that started Shipwire and we were, it was early stage. We just, we were just trying to figure out what to do. We literally sat down and it was like we merged minds. It was weird. We sat down and we're like, I said, here's my plan. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I think we can take this company. And, and like, it was a fit on a lot of different levels. And I knew how to go evangelize the company, and I had no shortage of ideas for evangelism. And that was a good fit at that stage. Also, we also could figure out how to sell it together. We could figure out all of these components together. So that's the hardest one to fit. But if you're, it, it's like, the, what's a great match for a co-founder? Right? They're willing to get down in the trenches. They have a ton of ideas for you. They know, 
they have an approach to the market that sounds reasonable to you, um, and they have, they're willing to go and be the, the tip of the spear as they go out there and do that. So, um, so for us, one of the first things we did, we had to go build brand. Um, so, I mean, we, like, the tr like going out, hitting trade shows, hitting all of like the e-commerce shows on a zero budget was painful, but it was, it was two years of travel. And somebody had to do it, and it ended up me, and this was all pre, uh, this was all um, pre-Airbnb, so if everybody remembers couch surfing, like that was the budget we had. That was literally the budget. Like if I, if I couldn't find a couch, then I could go get a hotel. But that was, that's how crappy it was. But like, like does that answer your question at all? They're, they're going to understand. Like you're going to you're going to feel comfortable with them doing this role, and because you haven't hit product market fit now, they are going to be part. They're not just a, a bag carrying salesperson. They're pro, part product manager. They're part marketing. They're part PR. They're um, they're capable of, of account managing for you. Like this is a this is this this person is a founder essentially. Any other questions? Um, okay, I don't know what stage I'm at. What the hell? Like, what the hell am I supposed to do? Um, so here's the checklist. Here's like a mental checklist that I had for like, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, have you proven the saleability and repeat saleability of the product? Right? So has any, well, let's just do a show of hands as we go through this. Who's at stage not sure? Okay. Have you proven the saleability of your product yet? Who, if you, you have? Raise your hand. Great. Um, are you getting inbound interest or do you need to go outbound? Who's getting inbound interest? Who's getting outbound interest? Who has to, sorry, who has to go outbound to, to generate interest? Okay. Um, have you hired two sales reps and they're hitting your idea of quota? Great. So, okay, so based on that, there's a bunch of people here that need somebody that's gonna go and hit the, hit the phones for them. And there's a bunch of people that are, are dealing with, with um, they've got enough inbound interest. I would say the inbound interest people that haven't hired a couple of sales reps to see if they can scale repeatability, that should be your first step, right? Get a couple of reps, get people that are next to you that you can co-sell with, see if you can um, get, get them accredited, meaning that they're, they're paying for themselves inside of quarter one or quarter one and a half. That way their burn, their burn rate's not too horrific, right? If you can, get two of them. I, 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 different things, different strokes for different folks. You want one person, two person. I like two people just because you can see what works, what doesn't. Odds are that like, between the two people, you're gonna have some great ideas that are generating and you'll be able to see if it's repeatable with people or if you just have an incredibly talented salesperson that's gonna be really hard to repeat, which is, Really, like, it's a problem. It's your first salesperson. They're super talented. You got really lucky. Your next two are complete flops. You're like, what's the problem here? So if you can solve that early on, you're going to be able to scale much faster exiting those two reps. Those people that have hired two reps, the question is, should you hire a couple of more? Do you want to manage them? Or do you need somebody to come in and help you start instrumenting? Do you need to, do you have account management that you need to start worrying about now? Do you have, um, can you feed an additional two reps with your lead gen flow, or do you need to increase lead gen in order to feed the new reps? So that's the kind of question you need to be asking. Do you have enough flow to feed the reps, or do you need to hire a different type of rep to generate flow as well? Or do you need to do a marketing hire next in order to increase the inbound flow so that then you can feed your sales reps? If all your sales reps are eating from the funnel that you've provided, and you hire somebody and there's nothing to eat, they're gonna wonder why you hired them. So fill the trough more. Any other questions on this one? All right, recruiting. Um, for the, your director, for your senior levels, um, it takes really good people um, a little while, let me just check something else. Okay, I'm doing interviewing next. Um, 
it takes really, really good people. Sales reps, um, if they've been really successful where they're at, are typically um, getting paid a residual on the amount of business that they have there. And it can be very expensive for them to move. So talk to, start talking to people that you want to work with a year ahead of time. It's going to take them a while to trust you. Um, trust is an equation. Look it up. It's a great equation. But they're going to they're gonna need to know that they can come to you and they're going to be able to make money working with you. Um, also, they need to start looking at when they're capable of moving if they've got you know, a sales rep that is just closed the biggest deal of his, his or her life and he's paid on a 12-month residual for that deal. They're not going to move for 12 months. right? There's just no way. So realize that sales reps take really good like management for sales takes a while to move. So get talking to the ones that you want to talk to now. I have a general thing that I always ask anybody I'm talking to, especially on LinkedIn, might you or somebody you know be interested in? Right? Let's them know that you're interested in them. At the same time, let's them know if they have somebody in their team that is interested in leaving. A lot of a lot of like really good like I run a marketing team. Um, I know who on my team is ready to step into a role that I can't provide them and that I need to help them move to the next stage, whether that's with my company or not. So when people come to me, I literally am like, okay, I'm not a fit for this, but I've got a rising star that I need to place. It happens. These are people, they, they're, they're building relationships for 25, 30 years. They're expecting these relationships for their career. You can bet that if you have a really great opportunity, they can't take it right now, but they know somebody who has, they're going to want to bring them that opportunity. I had a really random thing happen to me um, maybe a two years ago. Uh, it was a really great opportunity for, um, for an Asian company come to the United States, uh, establishing a, a new brand in the United States. And they wanted, they wanted a senior marketing sales leader. Um, and that could understand product as well. That's a complex ask, right? That's, that's not easy. Um, I had somebody in my, in my network that I had been doing some networking with. And I posted this to him. I'm like, hey, are you interested in this? He's like, I can't move right now. I just started this other company. I need to give it a year. But I've got somebody that is a rising star that I want to place. We placed this person. I didn't even know about it. But this question, might somebody, might you or somebody you know generated the interest that I was able to forward, he took the deal, that kid made a ton of money, I think he actually retired for a few years. I was like, ah, right? But I get an email back from, from my friend like a year later, he's like, hey, I don't know if you ever heard about this story, but I forwarded this request after talking to you to one of my rising stars, and now that guy is minted and I'm really jealous of him, but like that's the network. So be willing to plug into people's network. Be really nice to them. Expect them to be building a rapport with the people you want to work with, because if it's not them, it's likely somebody they know. Um, and give them the time. And they, the first conversation is not going to do it. It may be your 30th conversation that does it. So be willing to start early. All right. Um, and if you're hiring this, like, if you're hiring a sales rep, rising stars are at every stack, every part of the stack. So um, if somebody is a, was a sales development resource at one company um, and they wanted to step into account management, but the company couldn't hire them, the company went through some problems, that's a rising star. You want it, you're, you'd be willing to take the hit on that person being your first account manager because they know how to generate lead flow, they know how to qualify, they know how to do all this. So anyway, any questions on, on recruiting? Did I make the point across it takes, it could take up to a year, so get started, that's the big point. Like, like hit your networks and keep on hitting them. All right, interviewing. Um, so your previous question, like how do you know? And especially with this entrepreneurial person, um, What's their 90-day plan? Does it align with what you think needs to happen? Maybe it's a 100-day plan, whatever. Like, what's their plan? And these are great questions to, to tell them ahead of time. Don't, sometimes, I, I've had the, like, weird questions sprung on me in interviews, and I'm like, ah, I wish I'd had, you know, 
five minutes to think about that because I would have, like, be willing to also give them a little time, right? Have them come in. It'll help them understand how serious you are about them if you tell them a little bit. These are the questions I'm really, really hoping you're capable of answering. They may actually need to go out and talk to a few people that understand the industry better. Give them the time to do that. Um, okay, so pick. Um, are they a process person? Do they have similar stage experience to what you're experiencing right now? So this is the question that you should be asking yourself as your business grows. If you're a, if you're a pre $1 million in annual recurring revenue company um, and, uh, and you hire somebody who's coming out of a 50 to $100 million annual recurring revenue company, they're not gonna understand your stage. They're, not, they're gonna walk in and you're like, there's the door for your sales. That's what we're providing to you. There's a door to go do sales and a phone. And they're like, I'm expecting decks, I'm expecting systems, and they just don't know how to do it yet. So I think stage experience is interesting. Or be willing to inject, eject all of this and hire somebody that is, if you have, we had a really complex customer support and um, Oftentimes, our customers would shoot themselves in the foot with our application. We hadn't built a lot of protection into it yet. So we needed somebody in sales that was also really good dealing with really like customers that are at, at a volcanic point in their experience with us. Um, so hiring somebody from Enterprise Rent-A-Car that had been dealing with people pissed off about car rentals for a long time made a lot of sense to us. right? But they had absolutely no market knowledge, no process, and they had no similar experience. But we were willing to like work with them because they were such good people. So, kind of look at what you're hiring for. Be willing to to pick and leave stuff. Don't look for the perfect fit. Um, I find now that when like if I'm hiring for marketing and business development, um, I absolutely want to hire for market knowledge because at this stage in our company, I don't have the time to be training them on market knowledge. And it's so comp the market is the e-commerce market is so is complex enough that if I put them in front of customers too fast and they are dumber than the customer, that's a bad thing. So I want somebody who's known their shift through. I will teach them similar stage experience and everything else, but I want market knowledge now. Um, sales is an art. Are they a student of their art? Um, hire like somebody who's really enthusiastic about sales and is willing to go and practice what they're doing um, is, is really, really valuable. So, there's ways to figure out if they're a student of sales. What's your favorite blogs that you follow? Who are your favorite sales VPs? Who do you wish you were working for? Why do you, like, why, not just like why are you in sales, but like why are you doing this particular type of sale? What do you want to do? Like get into it, get into their head and figure out what they, are they able to, are they able to deal with a hundred no's in their life to get to that one yes every day? Um, would you buy from? So watch out. The big, the big one that we bumped into a couple times is um, you get a lot of people that kind of are dazzled by Silicon Valley in the startup scene, and they come to you and they're you're really excited to be talking to them, but they've got uh, a wife, two kids, they're over their head in a mortgage, um, and what you're paying is just not going to carry them through. So really be willing to when you're interviewing, get underneath the hood of these people to see whether or not you've got a ticking time bomb of somebody that can't afford to work there. And 60 days after you hire them, they're gonna turn around and ask you for a raise or they're gonna, they're gonna dump a problem on your lap that you don't wanna deal with. So this is, this is like my biggie with, with early stage startups. You have to have somebody that's capable of taking the risk of the startup at the stage. If you've got enough money in the bank that you can fund somebody's life for the next 18 months and you know it, that's a different stage, right? So watch out for that one. Any questions on this? We've done, we've done that. We have, we've definitely, uh, we've definitely done that, especially, um, the answer is yeah. So the question is, um, 
have have we been willing to have I been willing to hire somebody straight out of college at, um, that is going to be a little less risk financially for the company and you're going to feel worse like is stage specific and, and can take the risk we have done that we've also hired people that we've also looked for people that have managed their life to a degree where they're capable of taking the risk and being in that risky boat with us as we float down the river right so just realize that people have lives they're, they're people they've got families kids going to school all that kind of stuff like like it's part of the hiring process to make sure it's a fit. Great. Yeah, so the question is, in a, B2B to, in a B2B to C play, in a fairly tight industry where you're dealing with SaaS, mobile, um, real estate, and, and, um, and enterprise sales in a, in a lot of ways, enterprise channel sales, which is even harder, um, uh, what should we wait in the hiring? Should we, hire, should we wait mobile? Should we wait um, uh, the their industry experience with the target customers. Um, in that example, I would be asking myself which one is gonna be the easiest, like if I couldn't get all three of those, B2B to C experience, an understanding of that specific target, because it's really enterprise sales at that point, right? And it's a weird type of enterprise sales. It's enterprise channel sales. So they need to not only be able to talk to, this, to the, the right company, they need to also be able to figure out if that company's capable of marketing your products or services and be able to help them build not just the sales, but the ongoing solution. So it's a lot of partnership account management and stuff like that. That's a complex ask for somebody. That's a really hard thing to train. Um, and then I look at like mobile and SaaS and, and I would ask myself, are these easier for me to, uh, to train and does, does my does the salesperson who understands what my business is trying to accomplish um, with this particular company actually the harder thing to train long term? So which one of them is going to be, what are you going to be able to get them up to speed on in 90 days much faster if they didn't have? Is the question I'd be asking myself. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Um, just resources, you guys. Uh, if you're building a, uh, an engine, uh, Aaron Ross put out a great book um, called Predictable Revenue. Check it out. If you're outsourcing, go to Upwork. If you have, um, if you have questions about sales, um, ask these two websites first. Uh, like, like Max, who's run Sales Hacker, has done a great job of uh, promoting a blog, a lot of sales experience in the room, especially if you're in SaaS. These are all SaaS sales. If you're doing these two sales, not the right thing. Um, I'll put that here. And, and maybe we'll, of course, if we have extra time, maybe we can throw a couple of these against this and see what yeah, we can do. Switch out the mic. So, does so, so anybody want to take their, like, what they're struggling with right, right now as a company and let's use it as an example and let's throw it against this problem set and see where you hire?
check to So the question is, um, he's got he's got a lot of inbound interest. It's an email encryption program for healthcare, and um, he's got two salespeople right now. But the problem set is um, is more than customer onboarding. It's customer lifetime value and being able to increase the 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 wallet of existing customers. Correct. Okay, so if that's the case, um, you've probably got a bunch of people stuck here. You're getting a certain amount of money and you want to get more money, right? Great. Totally, right? So the problem isn't getting them initially signed up. So it's not an SDR problem. You don't have a problem vetting your inbound and figuring out if they're a good fit for your company, whether or not you're a fit for them and they're a fit for you. That's not the problem. They already know that you just want to you want to give. So now we're dealing with like customer support and account management, right? So given what you're doing, I would hire a cust like somebody to start looking at long-term customer success, and um, and how you're going to increase your your the customer value long-term. So that would be down in here, and I would say that you could probably do it with a junior person, especially since it's it's a renewal and upsell off a renewal, right? What's nice about these engines is that there's a couple of really interesting things that occur. These account reps, closers, expensive, they gotta be good, and um, they have to know your product. S sales development resources, and oftentimes customer support and account management, um, these can be pockets where you bring in junior people, train them, and then promote them in here. So what you might do is start looking at should I start another part of my team, which is in the customer success, and the people that are really good at driving customer success, you can offer them positions to move into account sales in the future because you can backfill them in a hurry. So in, at Shipwire right now, customer success and SDRs are our feeding pools for our account management and our account reps. I don't. I would say that we, maybe it's 70-30, promote from within versus hire external. And usually when we hire external, it's because we're trying to get regional specific. We'll hire an external person in Australia or Europe um, because we couldn't, we couldn't promote somebody into it. All right, you wanna do yours? May as well. It's like it gets them target. Like again, if you if if they've got, it keeps them. You you don't have to if they're motivated to do it. But um, and okay, so it's not the same sale as a brand new customer. It's a different type of sale. Um, you can offer a different percentage. You don't have to give them the full sales comp package on it. They're an existing customer. You're looking at it a different way. Your P&L has to look at it a different way. Um, you can offer them a different percentage because they already have a relationship with them, but you can get somebody really excited and you can help them um, understand that you're assigning value to that particular activity by providing a account upsell comp plan. And it has to be easy to manage though. Oftentimes you have a, high, a lot of growth. So one of the, the one of the, um, is the base growing organically or do they actively have to upsell? And if the base is growing organically, then you shouldn't probably be comping them the same value as if they're upselling. So for example, if I've got three accounts and they're all growing at 10%, right? Um, should, I, should I, the CEO, be paying them for that 10% growth or sh should I be paying the application and, and like, like going, wow, we did a great job, we built something that's really working, and I don't need to do that. But if somebody gets an account to grow 50%, should they get the 40% upsell? So the question becomes, what can you track? What are they actually doing? Are they inking a new deal so that you can actually track the flow of the contract? Or is the base organically growing and you wanna offer them a lower percentage of that total base growth to keep them motivated and to help them grow their book of business, but it's not, it's not three percent 
of the upsell, it's one and a half percent or a half a percent. Does that make sense? So, uh, so the conversation right now is is um, how to structure compensation for account management growth specifically on the base um, or net new revenue. Um, and I would, your account managers are typically um, you're you're comping them on the new sales for the year, right? So if they're growing it. Your, it's net new sales, and then their base resets the next year to whatever was new. So you're like, you don't set it in year one, and then look at it three years out and be like, oh, we're comping them for the growth from year one. That's not what you would be doing. You'd be looking at it every year, and you're incrementally stepping them up because your accounts should be growing. Does that, does that answer your question? It depends on your comp plan, um, and you're actually asking a level of question that starts to get into how many sales reps do you have. You're now getting into tuning an engine. You're, this is a pretty, this is a tuning question. You can, you can make in your first, I would say that, so from experience, we made our, um, the first few years at Shipwire when we were going was incredibly lucrative for the sales team. Right, we didn't have our comp plan tuned exactly to the business need, and we uh, we were over comping for a lot of stuff. Um, and so, but in a lot of ways, like that's one of the benefits of joining a startup is you can get paydays if you can if you can get them. Um, as we've gotten larger, we've condensed down, and now the comp plan is set to a specific growth period, and net new revenue is, is comp for the growth inside of the six or 12 months. Um, they don't get comp outside of that because we expect the platform to be growing them, and the account sales rep is not on that deal six to nine months later. We're expecting them, in a mid-market account, we're expecting the sales rep to be playing with that account for six months, and then it should go to the account manager or to the base and the sales rep should be focused now. They, I don't want my sales reps focused on growing existing business. I want them to grow new business, right? So I want my sales reps hungry for new business. Uh, and then my account managers will, will, will help them um, get compensated for growth of the base. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, coin operated, where are you gonna put your coins? Do you want them growing the base? Pay them to grow the base, but then you're not gonna get new sales. You want new sales? Pay them to grow new sales. Okay. Anybody else? Hold on. Let me go over here. Thanks. Okay, so there's two questions, and this is on the evangelical, um, the entrepreneurial salesperson. Uh, let's go here. Um, the first is, is there an understanding they're only going to be there for a couple of years? And then, um, and then the second question is, uh, how, do you, how do you find them, basically, and how do you have fit? So we kind of talked to the fit question earlier. Um, this, is the, this is the hardest one, right? Um, so I don't know if there needs to be a tacit agreement because uh, like, if your business is growing and getting more dynamic, sure, they may be there for their vesting period or they may be there for the period of time to get going. And you know, if, if they help you get to the next stage, then wish them well if they don't want to stay kind of thing. Like, that's great. But if, if they're constantly in the, at the vanguard of where your business is supposed to be, um, then the business should keep them interested enough to keep on going because your business is typically going to evolve and morph into more larger parts of a dynamic market, right? Because you're trying to continue to grow your business, so you're going to open up new business lines. 
Maybe the same evangelical salesperson is going to be the person that wants to open your Asia office, right? You don't know what is going to happen in the future, so I wouldn't necessarily. You can have that agreement. It can be tacit. You could. It could be an idea that you're both playing with. You know, be upfront with each other, but also tell them, look. My job is to also grow a business that keeps you interested and that has all sorts of new things for you to go and, and do and sell. Um, so that's one. The second is we already kind of touched on it a little bit, like how do you find fit for this person? Um, again, I think it's I think it goes to like all of the aspects of especially if you're really early stage and this is one of your first five or ten people in. Um, are they? Are they so? For me, I fit, when I, when I came in, we didn't have marketing, sales, we, we barely any revenue, nothing, right? And so I could plug in, I could go, okay, look, I'm gonna join and I'm gonna take this entire piece of business. I'm gonna take marketing and sales and I'm gonna take business development, I'll take all the channel stuff, I'll do all the developer related. Like, you're gonna see somebody who comes in and is like, wow, they're acting like a founder, they're not acting like I've, I've, I have a job to do when I'm here. Their job is to grow the business. So think about, are they coming in with a plan to grow your business? Did that answer your question? Okay. Perfect. So uh, the question was, uh, he's in a mapping company and he had a SDR that was really into mapping. Um, and then he asked, right at the end, he, he, uh, you said, I was a little concerned because once they finish the Rolodex, then what's next? Um, which tells me that you actually aren't looking at the problem, right? Your problem is, do you have enough lead gen volume on your own? Or is are you trying to hire somebody that is going to be an outbound sales rep? So I think you're actually looking at the problem wrong. You need to look at the problem of what am I hiring for? Am I hiring for somebody that's going to go and get me more leads? Or am I hiring for somebody that um, is going to manage uh, a bunch of leads coming in? And so those are two very different types of uh, sales reps, it's SDRs. So if, you're, if the problem is actually that you don't have lead flow and you need to hire for lead flow, then I would be asking this person, how are they gonna generate lead flow? And I would be asking myself, what do I need to do today before I hire the salesperson to generate enough lead flow so that their first 90 to 180 days, they're, they're both working on new lead flow and working on my existing lead flow. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, we're probably gonna wrap up here too, so let me just check. Is it timing? Oh, we're over, okay. So uh, I guess we're done. Thank you. <laughs>